Um, I'm Ariel and work with the founding director of SPIVA. It is so wonderful to see you. 30 seconds about SPIVA. SPIVA is about revolutionizing the way that women come together in community and using community to empower women as individual change makers in our own lives and in the world. We define Jewish and women very broadly. If you want to be with us, we want you with us and welcome. We love that we are multi-generational and diverse in our backgrounds and our affiliations, and we come together in celebration and support of women, our strengths, our unique perspectives, and our ways of impacting the world. Um, as always, I hope that tonight is just one of the many, many opportunities to see your faces because we have much more coming up. The next session for this series, I want you to write it down on your camp on your calendar right now. Um, next Tuesday, the 12th. And we are also getting together before Yom Kippur for an outstanding Her Torah on Wednesday, September 20th. And we'll put the link in the chat and Aliza will tell you more about it in a minute, but save the date because we would love, love, love to be with you this season as much as possible. Um, please also say hello to the fabulous Emily Bell, our amazing outreach and communications coordinator who is literally the wings beneath Viva, <laughs> the wind beneath Viva's wings. Um, thank you, Emily, for everything. You have worked tirelessly this summer and held Spiva together in so many ways. Thank you for being here tonight. Before we get started, I want to stop talking, but I want to say one thing. I want to just say a very, very personal thank you to you, to each of you for being here tonight, um, and to Nama and Aliza and to Emily, a little bit TMI, um, but I just had a birthday two weeks ago, and I was thinking about how I really don't give myself a lot of me time. I'm not good at making time for myself. Um, sidebar, I got to wondering if that was because I was too afraid. I'm too afraid to be alone with myself and what I might discover, or if I really just like being surrounded by others. So that got a little deep. <laughs> um, but then my birthday celebrations intermingled with the planning for everything that we are doing for this holiday season. And I got to throw myself into the planning of it with Aliza and thinking about all the holidays together with Aliza. And as we were planning, I just wanna say thank you for this very, very precious gift of being together in a community that I love and trust this time of year. I, I so do not take it for granted. And I wanna thank you for making me pause and gifting me a minute for me during this very, very busy time of year. Um, I wouldn't have it without you. And I am so thankful to have it with you. Um, and while we're together, I like to believe that this time of year is just a little bit holier, a little bit more primed for prayer. So can I just ask a favor that before we dive into our learning together, can we just take 30 seconds to have in mind some of the folks that we know and love who might need a prayer to this coming year? Um, if you want to stick their name in the chat or come off mute and say their name out loud or just have them in mind, um, can we just for 30 seconds concentrate our tzilot, our prayers and good wishes to those who need a little boost um, for this coming year? Right now I'm going to hand it over to Rabanita Liza, who will tell us more about what we're going to do tonight and this month, and you'll see her bio in the chat. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you so much, Ariella, and um, it's wonderful to see all of you. A special shout out to Sarah Beth Neville, who just moved to the United States a few days ago. So hello and welcome. Um, I am so excited about tonight. I feel like um, every year when it comes to be Rosh Hashanah, especially after the summer vacation, there's kind of this dread like, oh, not only do the kids have to go back to school, but we have to go to Rosh Hashanah. Um, and there's this feeling of a, of a judge who is, who is coming to check everything that you've done. Have you been naughty or have you been nice? Um, and um, Naamah's teaching about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is so different from that. Inspired by the work of uh, of Yumima, she um, she takes us on a journey um, of what this month of Elul, the month before Rosh Hashanah, could be, and um, how Rosh Hashanah really is a time of birth. Um, and it's really always uh, really an honor to learn with you, Naama. So thank you for being here. Um, Naama's bio is in the chat. Just briefly, she is a teacher and a learner. 
Her interest in holistic systems takes her between different worlds, environmental education, inner work, Jewish learning, and embodied practice. As a PhD student at Hebrew University, she studies environmental policy networks. Outside of academia, she is the lead teacher at the Enayi Chionim Fellowship for Spiritual Climate Leadership and a recent alumna of the Jewish Pedagogies of Wellbeing Fellowship at M Squared where she developed writing protocols using the Yamima method in order to bring feminine voices into Jewish well-being discussions. Her flower studio, Intentional Flowers, offers Kabbalistic inspired floral designs and home ritual building sessions. She lives with her husband in Berkeley, California. Naama, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you and really honored to be here. Um, hi everyone, good evening, um, wherever you are. I'm trying to remember every night to go outside and look at the moon, I don't always remember. But um, years ago, when I had the good fortune of learning um, a year in yeshiva um, in Migdalos, our teacher Esti always said to us, look at the moon when the moon will become very, very, very small and everything will become very, very, very dark, that will be the new year. And we're now 10 days before Shoshana. It's really, it's really coming. And slowly everything darkens. And that's the only holiday in the year that we celebrate in the dark. All the other holidays we're celebrating the full moon. And I always kind of feel that I love bringing the moon to our classes because Really the moon um, and being with the moon is connecting us to a feminine plane of, a li of life and life can be lived in many different ways. Um, and basically, and I feel like we have a short time, so I'll try to bring, um, okay, what I can, but um. Basically, for me, it's a really huge gift. I started learning uh, 12 years ago and practicing the Amima method. It was, I was impacted by my grandmother who did it, started at 80 years old. And when I started practicing, I it opened for me a huge window into living in the feminine and practicing from the feminine and feminine traditions in our Jewish tradition. And we live in a very, very adrenaline driven world, a very masculine world. We're running all the time. We're completing tasks and outcomes and reaching outcomes and being really cool and it's great. But there's a balancing act of the feminine, which is not running in a straight line, but actually goes in cycles, deepening in cycles, rests, a place of balance, a place of a moon that comes every time to the same place. It's not about the new, it's about the renew, it's the renewal. And that's a different way of being. And we're gonna try to talk a little bit about ways that we can practice in this 10 days that are going to lead us to Rosh Hashanah, um, that can give us um, some, of that, some of that feeling. But before we start, um, I want us to just land here and trans trans transition into this space from the many things that we're doing. So I have a few questions. And first one, I know we're coming from many different backgrounds. So I, I wanted to ask everyone, if you can put in the chat, like one to three words about what um, comes to your mind when you hear Elul, when you hear about that we're now in Elul, what, is that, what does that bring up for you? Okay, guilt, king in the field, time to prepare, looking inward, magical, time of immense ho holiness, rejuvenation, pressure, judgment, evaluation, last chances. Oh, 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 oh. great. <laughs> Cheshbon nefesh, uh, gentle, fresh start, nice, shofar, Psalm 27, reflection, preparing, tender, et ratzon, time of willingness, 
um, contemplation, Virgo birthday, taking account of yourself and actions, things pending, 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 purity, returning to God as a primary uh, way of being and living, panic, um, peacefulness, renewal. Great. Um, okay, so keep it coming. Um, and I think already we see pretty clearly that people have different experiences of Elul. For me, growing up, I was definitely in the in the more guilt and kind of like preparing mode. This is how I was educated. And um, the big image of Rosh Hashanah was the image of coronation. You're going to come in front of the king and the king is going to judge you. And you better be ready. You better be ready with the right answers to explain why you behaved the way you behaved the whole year and how you want to behave next year. And there was a lot of anxiety around it. Um, and I remember teachers even telling us, even the fish in the sea are trembling in Elul. Um, and I think Elul is, does have anxiety, but I think that anxiety can also be connected to something else. It can be connected to the anxiety of a new birth, of us being willing to step and kind of like remember the word alive. We're gonna talk in the high holidays a lot about who's gonna die and who's gonna live. And this is something that usually the whole year we sometimes, we don't have time to even think about it. We're, we're so entangled in life, but we're coming to these days. And in these days, we might think that we need to come and be judged and be, and, and, and show, so show our receipts that we're worthy or, we might think about it as a totally different thing. We might think about it as a time when we're coming to remember that we're alive. We're coming to actually go through a birth. And our liturgy is full of that language, full of like the stories that we're going to read on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, of Hana, the story of Sarah waiting for a kid. And, and, in my mind, one of the thoughts I was like, the image of coronation is so strong, right? Coming and there's like such a strong ceremony and you're coming in there. But I was thinking for the last few years, maybe we can also think about it as the day of crowning, not the day of coronation, the day of crowning, the day of like opening up to the rawness of life, remembering that we are born and we will die and then what does it mean for us to be in that place? What does it mean for us to be intimately open to our soul, to our life, to the fact that we're alive, to God as a life-giving, and to the new year? What life do we want to bring into that year, to ourselves and to the people around us? And that is not a place where I'm being judged for my value. That's a place that I'm coming, I'm, I was good and I'll be good, as you mean teaches, you're good from the beginning, you'll be good in the end. But it's a place that I'm coming to open up. And to open up is not an easy thing to do. And maybe Elul is a time for us to prep for opening up and for being present in that place. Um, I'm going to ask two questions in a moment, but before I'm doing it, I just want to acknowledge also, speaking about birth, and the rawness of life can be triggering for some people. Um, some of us go, including my own self, through all kinds of fertility um, journeys. And Rosh Hashanah is a time where you kind of feel, you kind of meet it really strong in your face. First of all, everybody with their new kids and new babies, and but also just the liturgy of, of birth. And I'm just putting it there, you know, that it could be hard for some people to talk about it so, so much. At the same time, I feel like birth and the feminine experience is just so lacking from our life and definitely from our Jewish traditional life. And having these images is so strong and gives us such a different way of relating to, to our life, to everything that we want to birth, projects, ideas, relationships, new um, opportunities. And 
And therefore, I, I really want to take us deep into that image today and to, and, to, and to say that today we're going to really work with the pregnancy stage. What does it mean to, if I want to be reborn on Rosh Hashanah, if I want to be totally present for that birth? How do I build the boundaries and the safe space and the protected place that I need to start the process? Which will, and these are the tools that we're gonna to talk about today. And next time, next week, we're gonna speak about, and how do I build for myself the capacity to then do the journey out from there, to be willing to go through a very narrow place to something that is uncertain and unknown, but is very real. Um, so I think God really opens for us this opportunity to, to connect, to connect to life, to connect to life, to feeling alive every year. And that it's really something that our tradition suggests to us. And that's where we're going today. But before we're going, um, I want us to, again, transition a little more so we already wrote a little bit about what Elul is for us, but I want to ask you now to take a minute to journal. Journaling is really a place where uh, Yenima teaches that we can meet ourselves without any judgment, just to let ourselves pour it to the paper and you can throw it to the garbage afterwards or keep it, whatever you feel you wanna do. But it's just a place to be intimate with ourselves. The paper is there for us. And we can be intimate with ourselves and put whatever we want. And we're going to do a few journaling, um, few journaling excerpts today. So first, I um, just want to ask you to journal a little bit about what is moving in me. And you can think, what brings me here tonight? What am I coming from tonight? What's an intention I have for the learning? And as you're thinking about it, just pay attention, like what's moving in you? What's going on for you inside? Um, and, and journal a little bit, and then you can share in the chat whatever you feel comfortable, maybe a word or two words, just so that we know where we're coming from because we're coming from many different places. So I'll call you back in a minute. And um, I'll put it in the chat.
Okay, so when you're ready, you're welcome to share. And just something that um, I always love is that Yamima, which we're not going to talk about tonight, but maybe Aria, you can send the recording of our Yamima Foundation classes that we did, said that when people come together to class, it's because their souls are connected in some way and that they're able to pull insights. You know, we have, I mean, we have a body and we have like a soul and our soul is connected and she says, and you can pull insights for other people and, and they will see what you're writing and it will fall exactly in place for them. You're not, you're not coming by chance to, to be with, with some group. So I'm already thankful for your words in the chat, moving towards what is possible. Ah, so good, nourishing. Um, especially on holy, won't let right wing. Okay. I've been feeling in between. And other people, uncertainty, a desire for a deeper life. And I'm not going to be able to read all of this, but I will read it afterwards. But really thank you for just bringing all this richness of our experiences, our life. Grief and regret. Intention to follow through. Okay. Great. Thank you. So yeah, and feel free to keep uh, populating the chat with whatever you're coming with tonight, what you're coming from. Um, and one thing that I really uh, hope that we're going to do tonight is build little bubbles of oxytocin. You know, there are two big hormones in our body. One is adrenaline. It really helps us pull through. And one is oxytocin, which really helps us to be present and to love. And we're very, we're, I think we're trained pretty well by our culture to be in adrenaline mode. Um, and I think we need to train ourselves to be in oxytocin world. And oxytocin mode, um, is like a little bubble where I can feel pleasure for a moment, where I can concentrate, where I can feel myself. And, you know, sometimes it's just to drink my tea and enjoy it for a moment. And sometimes it will be just taking two minutes to even just massage my hands um, or talk to someone that I love. Um, but to create these bubbles, we have to put boundaries. And uh, I'm going to talk about two tools that we can use for that. And I think a lot of what pregnancy is, is really to be in a boundary, a boundary that holds you safe and protected and keeps, makes sure that you have what you need. And I think parents also create boundaries, right, to protect their kids. This is time that you need to go to sleep. This is the time that you are going to do that. Um, and in in this session, we want to talk, how do we create this for ourselves? How do we create these little bubbles of oxytocin, these little bubbles of places that are holding us, even for like a few minutes a day, so that we can start our work of opening up to the big meeting that we have in 10 days. Um, so I want to just sing us one song. Um, before we're going into the tools themselves, I'm going to dictate a few texts and give you some instructions of how to work with these texts. Um, and the song that I started that I thought will be proper for tonight is a song that my mom put me to sleep with um, in my childhood. And I think it's pretty known, Hamala um, Chagoyeloti. So I thought that would be a nice way for us to just kind of like land into the intention to create for ourselves a safe space where we can feel very safe and fall asleep very well and let our sleep and rest really grow us. 
Uh, this learning that we're doing, Yamima said all the time, the learn, the le you come and you do the learning with the text and the text will, the material, she called it, the chomer, will work on you. It's not all your responsibility to remember and to, that's, don't worry about it. We're doing the work and then the work is kind of like, we're building the womb and then it works for us. So I'm putting the intention in this song really to kind of like, make sure that we're creating these places for ourselves, places where we feel safe and and things can happen to us, even without us moving a lot to do it. So I'm, si I'm gonna sing it without the words, just the melody. All right. So, um, let's start with our first tool for today, the mechitza. The mechitza. Do you know it from Shul? Um, then you know it's a separation, and um, and uh, we said that we want to concentrate today on building boundaries. So we're gonna. We're gonna learn two tools. One is called the mechitza, and the other one is called connection to mistakes. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts, but then I'll share some of my thoughts about mechitza. But I just know uh, the word we're gonna use is separation. Separation is sometimes a little bit of a hard word for people. Um, and I just wanna say, Yemima said, Separation is not disattachment. Separation is actually your ability to connect. So I want you to hold it in mind as we're speaking about separation. Um, I'll also say that in our um, in our first creation story, so Rosh Hashanah is a day of birth, right? Day of the birth of the first person, according to our tradition, coming from the earth and going back to the earth at some point. Um, and, um, and in the first story of creation, the first on the first chapter, the, the human is made actually of two people, right? A man and a woman. And the Kabbalistic tradition says that they're connected in their back. And when they're connected in the back and there is no separation, they can't speak. They can't see each other, basically. They can't see each other's face. Only when they're separated, it's when they can actually have a dialogue or communicate or interact. So this is another way of thinking about separation. Um, just like it's our ability to say, this is me, this is not me. And now I can communicate with something. Um, but also let yourself uh, take, the, 
take the homer to wherever it takes you. Um, so I'm going to dictate. Please write it in your journal. And then we'll take some time to just be with the material, with the homer. And you'll just try to see which word speaks to you. And then highlight the words that speak to you. And see what kind of insights do you get from that? What is relevant to your life when you read it? What is just like interesting to you? Um, and again, this is a material that we're pulling. We're pulling threads of understanding to open it up. So I'm starting. Elul is the gate of the new year. Separation of times from year to year. She introspects her soul and mind. and ends the part that belongs to spiritual poverty. She merits God willing. A foundation of Judaism is the renewal. Every year in Elul, A very important month in which there is a turning towards compassion. Entering next year. After all, is not related at all to last year. There is a separation in time. I'm going to put the text in the chat. Um, I always want people to first hear it as it goes through our body um, when we write it from our ear to our to our hand. Um, it is in the chat now if you want to look at it, but the way you wrote it is perfect. And please take two, three minutes to just go through it and see Again, which words speak to you? What do you understand? And is there anything that is relevant specifically to your experience right now? And then we'll share in the chat. Um, I'll call you back in three minutes.
Can I hear you? Is anybody talking? No, not at the moment. Oh. We're just taking time <laughs> for reflection on the next. <laughs> you look like you, medit you were meditating. I'm sorry. Okay. Take a few more seconds to be with the material and then we'll come back together.
I'm reading through the chat and it's so rich. Um, I didn't realize how strongly I would react to the gift of a clean slate. How do you lock the gate and leave behind what you don't want to bring with you? Compassion for self is the hardest. Poverty can be an identity, for sure. Spiritual poverty can be a habit. The not related all to last year spoke to me. I believe that most of us, the person we most need to do two ways with ourselves, the gate swing both ways, ending the part that belongs to spiritual poverty, depression in time, not related to last year. Yeah, and a lot of people are also like, how do, really, how do, how do we leave things in the other side? And of course, it can also sound almost like, sometimes a separation, as I said, can sound like a violent thing. I mean, I can't unmake things in my life. And that's, it's not possible and also not what we want to do. Because really all our work here, you know, if I can see something that kind of like happens to you, what you can do is very limited, but what you can do is you can balance and you can eat healthy and you can rest. And in a way, when we're building our boundaries to ourselves also, what we can do is not very active, but it's the power of passive that Yumima teaches, which we learned that is negative, but she says it's so important to learn to rest, to learn to balance, to learn to be with things and separation too, is not a place where I'm pushing away things. One thing about separation of times, you know, in the Hebrew language, the night, the evening, what we're now in, is called Erev. Erev is also the word for Irbuv, for mixture, where everything is so mixed up. And I don't know where things start and where things end. And that's sometimes what happens in our mind. In Elul, we're saying we're, we want to wake up for something, right? In the Pew team, in, this, in the songs of the Slichot, we will say, Ben Adam, Malecha Nirdam. We will also read it in Yonah. A human, why are you sleeping? Wake up. We can sleep a lot of our life. And sleep is a place where like things are, are mixed up. Um, what is that waking up? Waking up at least in Yimima's teachings, is really opening up our awareness and being able to see and tag. All of work is really to see and say one of two things. Is this thing necessary for my existence or is it not necessary for me? Is this something that is right for me right now or is it not right for me right now? When we do separation in time, we want to wake up to our ability and our capacity to choose. It's not that we're going to make things that we don't like disappear. Actually, the whole point, as we said, when we get to Rosh Hashanah, is to be with life, to be with reality. But how am I being with it? So Mima says, really, 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 it's a new year. And really, you don't have to be what you were before. But it's not that you don't have to be what you were before because you were bad. No, not at all. It's just that there were things that were stuck for you and it doesn't need to be like that anymore. Her idea is also that there, within us, there's always a child that seeks security. And the child that seeks security goes to the mechanism that she knows. If she knew that if she'll be sad, people will give her attention, that that's what she does. And there's also a learner and the learner trusts. The difference between the child and the learner, which are both within us, is that the child seeks security and the learner learns to trust. And when we're coming here to the new year, she says, not everything is the same. Not all of our life is the same. Something that we feel very identified with might be very different very soon. So we separate in a way the turbulent kid, the child, from the learner. And as we're standing in the gate, and maybe very significant things happened to us this year. And maybe very harsh things and maybe very strong things. Every year brings whatever it brings, whatever life it brings. But she says, when you are facing this thing, can you 
sit, can you ask, what do I need now and come close to yourself? Or are you gonna be in a place where you are in spiritual poverty? Spiritual poverty, as people here mentioned, is a habit. Spiritual poverty is when I feel like I don't have a chance, I have to behave like this, I have to feel squeezed. And I'm even maybe mad at myself that I feel like that and I'm judging myself. And you know, it says, you know, the, the poor feels like they don't have a, a chance, they don't have an option. Everything is so squeezed. She says, Elul is a time that reminds you that you can stop for a moment. Take a breath and just look at this and say, what is this thing? This is how we do separation. I'm just allowing myself to stop for a moment, even after the fact, and look at the thing and say, is it necessary or is it not necessary for my existence? And she says, your awareness, your consciousness will know to release it the more you'll teach her that this is not necessary for you. So in a way, in a lul, when we're coming to the time of separation, when we're standing in front of a gate that opens and closes, first of all, we know not everything is mixed up. We're not lost forever in whatever it is that we feel right now. And we're not here to criticize ourselves. We're actually here to see ourselves with intimate eyes. We're opening our eyes. And that's the place of compassion. You know, Rabbi Nachman asked, how is, it, how is it possible that in the 13 attributes of, com of compassion, one of them is truth. Truth doesn't sound like a very compassionate place. If I just look at myself and I see myself for the, for the real, real person I am, it sounds very critical. So Rabbi Nachman says, actually, when you're willing to see yourself for who you are, that's a place of compassion. Just, just say, this is who I am right now not to judge it. So going back to our images, again, if we're going into a coronation, into a judge, then yes, I need to just do the introspection and make sure that, that, I, that I repented. But if we're going now to go through a very strong experience, through a crowning, through a gate into a new part of our life, then we just want to be present. And our way to learn to be present is, first of all, to create some buffer. Because rich people, that's what they have, right? A buffer. And if you're spiritually rich, then you have a buffer. Just one moment to do a reflection and see yourself and say, this is who I am now. And this is something that I felt today. And is it necessary or not necessary for me? But it's not about me being good or bad. It's just like, is it necessary or not necessary for me? with a lot of softness actually, because I have a journey and I have a soul and I'm going somewhere and I'm stopping to look. I'm stopping to just give myself a little space, a little boundary, separation in time to say, oh, now I'm stopping, it's a new year. Now I'm stopping to do an introspection and the introspection is to end spiritual poverty which means the introspection is to stop for a moment and say, what are energies that are not good for me? And I'm not fighting them. I'm just tagging them. Mima even says these energies can come to you also from other people. It's not just your own feelings. It can come to you from other generations. But you're giving yourself now a moment to stop and breathe and look at this and say, is it needed for me? Is it not needed for me? Is it needed for my existence? Is it not needed for my existence? And I don't know, I kind of feel like, and then smile to yourself, say, wow, well done. I'm building my wealth. I'm building my spiritual wealth as I'm about to come to this point that I want to be really present for. I want to be really present. I want to be really intimate. And I'm doing these separations so that I can communicate with it. I know that it's not my whole experience. This thing that I feel because someone undermined me or this thing that I feel because someone I don't know, hit me the wrong way, or this thing that I feel because something that I did is not all of me, is not all of my experience. I'm separating. I can separate. I can say, oh, I responded to it from a place of a child, which is like a very strong place and a very protective place. And I can move now to a learner and ask, what do I need now? What do I need now? 
And that separation is really the beginning of building our little bubble and a place where I'm turning towards myself and say, okay, and what is something that I need now? So now I tagged this, this thing and I made it a little clearer to myself. And what is the thing that I need now for the next two minutes? So this is separation of time and the, and the introspection of Elul. And the introspection of Elul is to end spiritual poverty. It's so nice. Don't you want to end poverty in the world? And you can start with ending it for ourselves to end spiritual poverty, to be, to let ourselves the option to breathe for a moment and say, I can be in a place that feels safe, even for two minutes. I can breathe here for two minutes and look at things without identifying with them for just two minutes and just tag them as necessary or unnecessary for my existence. Um, I really feel attracted to read the chat, but I'm not going to do it right now because um, I want us to do another little dictation with another little tool um, that can help us build our little bubbles, this Elul, in these coming 10 days, really bubbles of compassion, bubbles of rachamim. You know that compassion in Hebrew, rachamim, um, holds the word womb. So really create a little boundary, a little 10 minute boundary where I can sit and journal and just reflect and do the introspection that he's not judging myself, but just giving myself space. A little bit of a safe space to breathe. And it creates things beyond what I can do. Just creating the boundary for me already will nourish me. So I'm going to do another short dictation from a different chilek, um, from a different portion that Yimima gave for Elul. So she would just like talk to people and they would write down her words um, and, and then would write their own interpretation. She was like, that's it, now it's yours. And now you find your own interpretation and you go on with what you're bringing down. All right, so here are the words. Again, I'm going to read it. Try to let it go through your ears to your hands. And I will put it in the chat afterwards. Act to your ability. And make many errors. You are allowed to make mistakes and as many as you want. Here, she makes a mistake Here, she repairs. The power of repair is greater than the power of the error. So it's in the chat. Um, and please take two minutes this time to just go through it, see which word resonate with you, see what's your interpretation to what you read, and if that's connected to your experience, and echo it to us in the chat. I'll call us back in two minutes.
Okay, so let's try to wrap up. And I see a lot of writing here about mistakes as being like great openings for learning. And it's true. At the same time, I mean, just think for a moment, how does it feel to make a mistake? Um, it can be pretty painful. We don't like to make mistakes. And um, some of us really don't like to make mistakes. And I remember when I first heard this chilek, this this portion from Yemima, I was like, wow. I mean, to, to, to be told that, you know, if you made a mistake, it can still be a great opportunity for learning is one thing, but to be told to make mistakes and as many as you want. And that's, that appears in her teachings few times. So in the chilek lelul, in the part that she gave for Elul, but also in a different chilek where she, where the name of the part that she gave is like, stop straining yourself, stop making efforts. And I think again, this speaks to our question of like, okay, so how do I make the separation? How do I make the separation in time? How do I make the separation in my experience? Making, making mistakes, especially in relationship, which is something that we go back to in Elul, um, is something that can be really painful. If you said something that you are sorry about, if you spoke too much when someone else maybe wanted to speak, it could be all kinds of places. And I'm hearing this, I think some of you already mentioned it in the chat, act to your ability. Act to your ability, do as much as you can. And I think it really speaks here about sometimes we're not doing mis we're trying to avoid mistakes because we really don't want to be angry at. So we're really looking at like the one who looks at us. So in, in the other portion where she speaks about it, she's like, you still see your mother's eye on you all the time, making sure that you're not making a mistake. But you can also ask, do you still see God's eye on you all the time, making sure that you're not making a mistake? And she says, if that's how you feel, then turn your attention back in and forget about it. Make the mistakes that you need to make. You need to slam the door, slam the door. Um, why? Because it will give you flexibility. The moment you'll be able to make mistakes. And then again, the way the, the same way we said about the the spiritual poverty, and then to say, oh, that was a mistake. That's not needed for me. But not to get into a loop with that mistake and say, oh, how did I do it? Why did I do it? She says, the moment you're starting to ask the whys and the how, and that will just push you forward into it. You actually want to separate yourself for the mistake. So you want to allow yourself to make them, to not be like all the time really kind of like constrained and feeling this contraction of like, oh my gosh, I just hope not to make it. You want to be able to just say, oh, that was a mistake. So I can look at it and I can say, oh, that was a mistake. It's not needed for me and come close. And that's the repair. And that she says is flexibility. To be able to be flexible with yourself. And later on in, I didn't bring the whole thing because it's a very long portion, but later on she says, and you know that the also in heaven, the judgment is full of flexibility and is full of compassion. God sees the mistakes and says, oh, mistakes. Okay. And then you're, when you're able to be flexible with yourself, then they're flexible. They, they want you to be flexible. Um. Yeah, and I agree with all these like lucky people who are older and it's easier for them. We'll get there too, um, but it's true. I feel it even about how I am now and how I was when I was in my 20s. You get a little softer. Your skin gets softer, your body gets softer and your mind gets softer too. And that's so lovely. Um, and 
I hope we can embrace that softness. So really, I just want to kind of, as, I'm, as we're nearing the end of our time, and we will stay here for 15 minutes afterwards to um, to talk and to hear your voices, which I'm so sad that we can't hear all of your voices all the time. Um, but just to kind of like collect it for ourselves for today. Our goal today was really to kind of reimagine Rosh Hashanah, not just as a time of judgment with a judge sitting on a throne, where you come to be judged if you were good enough or not. And the introspection that you need to do is to make a long list and make sure that all the bad things are not going to repeat. And now you're going to do it right, which sometimes is important. I'm not against it. I'm just saying this is one strand of our tradition. But today we came here together to think of a different way of imagining Rosh Hashanah as God basically being on the birthing stool with us and we're coming into that space to say, oh my gosh, I'm alive. Even though sometimes I forget that I'm alive, I'm alive. I'm going to die one day. I was born one day. And I want to be connected to my force of living. I want to live to the fullness of it. I want to be connected to the source of life. This is Rosh Hashanah too. This is the crowning. And to be there, you really have to be able to be open and vulnerable and intimate. So the kind of preparation that we need for that is to first put ourselves back in our original place, in a boundary place, in a safe place, in a protected place, that's the womb. The way we can do it is by separation, the introspection, the same cheshbon nefesh that we spoke about is not happening in front of the judge, but it's happening in front of the midwife and basically say, I'm separating everything that is not relevant for me right now. I'm separating everything that is not relevant for my existence. I'm still me. There are all kinds of things that are happening to me, but I'm separating and I can take a breath and say, what's right for me now? Connect all the time to the life force that really pushes me forward. The thing that feels very authentic to me and just separate the things the energies that are not needed here right now. And to do it with softness, I'm not pushing it away. I'm just giving myself time to see it. I'm giving myself allowance to make mistakes. And you can say it to the people you live with in the house if you live with other people and be careful because then they'll say it back to you. This is what happened to me. Um, but it's a reminder you're allowed to make mistakes. You just wanna be flexible and soft with them too to be soft and and flexible in that regard means I'm all the time willing to come back to myself. I'm all the time willing to come back to myself and to make a separation that allows me to come back to myself. And that is the first set of tools that we're gonna use in the coming week. Um, so first of all, no effort. The words already are working on you. Uh, I love going back to the words and kind of just look at them and look at what I wrote maybe a few days after and maybe add a few things. But this is our intention for our tiny pregnancy as we're reaching Rosh Hashanah. Next week, we will really kind of dive into two other tools where we're going to dive head forward into the birth canal of Rosh Hashanah. So... Thank you so much for echoing these beautiful words in the chat and whatever, um, um, you know, also was happening with you. And um, hopefully we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you so much, Nama. Um, I learned so much from you and I learned so much from everybody in the chat. So thank you. I think that sometimes um, just to echo what you said, on Rosh Hashanah we, and Yom Kippur, we think so much about all the bad things that we've done that we just pull them with us into the new year because we're just thinking about them. And it doesn't give us space to kind of push them away and think about who we are without them. Um, so thank you for helping us build the space um, to start to think about who we are and how we want to birth ourselves um, in the coming year. 
as Naama said, um, next week we'll be meeting again. Um, that is uh, September 12th at 8.15 if you'd like to continue and do part two of, of this series. Um, and then between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur on um, September 20th, we are going to have a, um, a special evening kind of about taking back Yom Kippur, I think is what we called it. And um, thinking about some of the themes that come up um, over Yom Kippur that are not helpful, themes of shame, right? I am so ashamed of myself for what I've done. How could I have done this? Moving from shame to a place of joy, thinking about Yom Kippur as maybe the happiest day of the year, the most loving day of the year. Um, and also thinking about um, some of the um, some of the pressure that we have to forgive on Yom Kippur. Forgiveness is actually not healthy for everybody, and it's not required of everybody. And um, to give ourselves some space um, to think about, to, to free ourselves from the pressure to forgive, um, and to think about some new ways of what forgiveness might look like in Yom Kippur, or what might be another way of thinking what we want about what we want to do on Yom Kippur that's perhaps healthier for us at this time. Um, so, um, and Naama will teach for us again and help us think even more about what this birthing process looks like. Um, and along with some other wonderful teachers. So I hope you'll join us for all of those things. Um, Naama is going to stick around for 15 minutes in case anybody has any questions for her or wants to discuss anything a little bit further. 